1756, the Scottish engineer James Watt was working on improving the steam engine. This is a model of one of his designs. Watt was very tight-lipped about his ideas, but one of his friends reported the work to another of his friends. The condenser's the thing. Keep it but cold enough and you may have the perfect vacuum, whatever be the heat of the cylinder. I also learned that the great difficulty was to make the piston tight. Piston, cylinder, condenser, this is the new language of steam power. And in the same recollection we read about the eduction pipe, the steam vessel, the reservoir, the air pump and the siphon. English was called up for the new technology. Watt's condenser was the key to efficient and practical steam power and it changed the world. revolution had arrived. The machines of the 19th century are still a great attraction, as we can see here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. But now, they're historical curiosity. Then, they were the cutting edge of technology. In 1851, the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations opened in the purpose-built Crystal Palace in London's Hyde Park. It was a display of manufactured goods of all kinds, and the greatest attraction was the machine hall. Queen Victoria was an enthusiastic visitor. In a lengthy and acutely observed diary entry, she wrote, excessively interesting and instructive. Here was every conceivable invention. Here were some of the industrial worlds and the English language's newest arrivals. Hydraulic power, centrifugal pump, lithograph, electroplating, dynamograph, and grandest of them all, Anhydrohepsoterian, which cook potatoes in their own juice. Practical inventions frequently roped in familiar terms. The men who built the machines were often clock and watchmakers by trade, and they brought their language with them. Wheels, teeth, pinions, leaves, pivots. Beasts of burden lent their names to the mechanical beasts which were replacing them. There was the donkey engine, which had its output measured by the new standard of horsepower. In the cotton mills, there was Samuel Crompton's spinning mule, and other inventions including the roving billy and the spinning jenny, which may be derived from the common names for male and female animals, as in billy goat and jenny ass. But the classical languages, Latin and Greek, were also employed by scientists, either through diffidence or wishing to claim a distinction for their discipline which matched anything in antiquity. They took the Greek terms logos, meaning word, and nomia, meaning distribution, and named new fields of inquiry, ologies and onomies, like biology, petrology, taxonomy, morphology, paleontology, ethnology, gynaecology, histology, carcinology, agronomy, geonomy, phytonomy and entomology. In the first part of the 19th century, these islands had become the world's leading scientific and industrial nation, and the language became an engine which drove it forward. Engine is a word with a long history in the English language. For instance, in the Middle Ages, it meant skill or talent. Then it became a machine, a weapon or a snare. Now it became part of the steam engine or the locomotive engine. And then in 1829, the word locomotive itself shifted and stood alone as a noun. The railway brought new meaning to a whole set of words. Track and line were both applied to the metal rails. Their junctions became points. Coach, carriage and wagon all left the road and rode the rails, while lorry began its life as a railway word and made the journey in reverse. Stations had been places for ships and troops before the word was first applied to the building behind me, Liverpool Road Station here in Manchester. And behind the locomotive was the train of carriages, a line of them, in the same way that English had spoken of a train of followers or the trailing train of address. Within 10 years of its first use, the train meant the locomotive as well as its carriages. The world was on the move, taking words and their meanings with it. What chance now of the 18th century ideal of ascertaining or fixing it when words were dealing with so much that was new?
Other words were shifting in meaning too, reflecting massive social changes. Factories had been foreign trading stations in the 17th century. Mills had once been places to grind corn. Now they both meant places of manufacture, and they were getting larger. The word industry had moved away from the idea of individual diligence or work and come to represent a whole institution. So had labor and capital, as the forces they described gathered pace. These aren't simply changes in the meaning of words, they represent changes in people's lives, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. In the mills, it was often children who took the cans of cotton fiber from one machine to the next. If output slowed down, blame was leveled at the child who carried the can. Some workers, like those at Quarrybank Mill at Style, were fortunate. They had model cottages built for them. But tens of thousands learned a new word, a word that English picked up off the London streets from the slang of the poor, and that word was slum. The economic miracle of the Industrial Revolution was also a curse. There was squalor and poverty on a scale never seen before in cities, especially in London. English was using a new word to describe social status. Instead of old terms like degree, status or rank, it now had class. And the slums were the realm of the lower classes, the working classes. The 18th century ideas of proper speech became stronger than ever, as the language police sneered at urban working class dialects such as Cockney. <laughs> 